name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and a very warm welcome to Brazier with me, Mark Longhurst, sitting in for Colin today. But as usual, all the fast-paced news from four until six and coming up in this next hour. Police have now named a nine-year-old girl who died after being shot in Liverpool as Olivia Pratt Corbill. It follows reports of a man firing a gun inside a house in Dovecote last night. And it comes after a spate of killings involving guns and knives on Merseyside and just days after the murder of a man in his 80s who was stabbed to death on his mobility scooter in London. It's not just the killings either. Criminals appear to be running right in our towns and cities. Just this weekend, a group of teenagers storming a McDonald's restaurant in Nottingham City Centre. They jumped over the counter to steal food and drink. So are we living in an increasingly lawless society? Is Britain indeed broken? The record for the number of channel migrants crossing in a single day has uh, been smashed yet again, with more than 1,000 being detected on small boats yesterday. It comes as GB News saw evidence that those trying to cross to the UK in the back of lorries continues to be a problem. Our Home and Security Editor Mark White will have the latest for us. And the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, no less, is calling for GCSEs and A-levels to be scrapped, all in favour of a new assessment system, which they say will better prepare school leavers for the workplace. So the debate for this hour, we're asking, is learning things not the way to be clever in the digital age? And joining us for the next two hours, political commentator Emma Webb will be with us with her views. Very welcome too. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Tatiana. Good afternoon. It is two minutes past four. I am Tatiana Sanchez in the GB newsroom. Police have named a nine-year-old girl who was fatally shot in her home in Liverpool last night as Olivia Pratt Corbell. Officers were called to a house in the Notty Ash area last night after an unknown man who was being chased by a gunman forced his way into her home. Police say shots were fired, they hit a woman, Olivia's mother, and then fatally wounded the child who was standing behind her. In the last hour, the schoolgirl's head teacher has paid tribute, saying the community is devastated. A manhunt is underway and police are asking for anyone with information to come forwards. Their family are absolutely devastated, inconsolable and heartbroken. I know that the murder of Olivia has rocked our communities, who are quite rightly upset and outraged that such an abhorrent crime has occurred here on the streets of Merseyside. This is not the time for anyone who knows who is responsible for this shooting to remain tight-lipped. It is time for our communities to come together with us and make Merseyside a place where the use of guns on our streets is totally unacceptable. 
Ukraine is on high alert amid fears that Russia could escalate attacks ahead of the country's Independence Day tomorrow. Parts of the cat capital, Kyiv, aligned with the wreckage of Putin's army. Public gatherings and events are banned there, and government employees have been told to work from home. Prime Minister Boris Johnson promised unwavering support for the people of Ukraine during an international conference on Russian-occupied Crimea. We will never recognise Russia's annexation of Crimea or any other Ukrainian territory. In the face of Putin's assault, we must continue to give our Ukrainian friends all the military, humanitarian, economic and diplomatic support that they need. A record number of channel migrants have crossed the English Channel in a single day. Nearly 1,300 were detected on small boats yesterday. It comes as GB News saw evidence that those trying to cross to the UK in the back of lorries also continues to be an ongoing problem. In the past year, official figures reveal around 8,000 people were detected at UK ports having illegally crossed the Channel. Industry leaders are warning households are facing a catastrophic winter amid soaring energy bills. EDF's managing director says half of UK families could be in fuel poverty come January, when the energy prices could reach £4,600. Conservative leadership candidate Rishi Sunak says he'll do all he can to support those that need it most. Cut VAT on energy bills to provide some help to everyone, but I want to provide direct financial assistance to two other groups of people, those on the lowest incomes and pensioners, because those people will need extra help this autumn and winter. And I know things are difficult, and I want them to be reassured that with me as Prime Minister, they will get the help that they need. Meanwhile, Liz Truss says she will put the West Midlands at the heart of her economic revival if she becomes Prime Minister. Ahead of the Conservative Party hustings in Birmingham this evening, Ms Truss revealed her plan to support businesses through lower taxes. The West Midlands is the latest area to be declared in drought. Officials are warning that despite recent rain, sustained wet weather in the coming months is needed to tackle the problem. It now means 10 out of 14 regions in England that the Environment Agency covers are now in drought. Three of these are classed as being in a state of prolonged dry weather, with Cumbria and Lancashire the only areas with normal water resources. The number of deaths that occurred during some of the hottest days in July were higher than average than on any other day in the month. Official figures show a 7% increase in the number of deaths on a day which saw extreme hot weather. Figures peaked at 1,775 on the 19th of July, the day Britain recorded temperatures of over 40 degrees Celsius. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Brazier. Tatiana, thanks very much indeed. Now, we start this hour with the latest awful news from Liverpool, where a nine-year-old girl was shot dead inside her own home. Police have now named her as Olivia Pratt Corbill. She was inside the house in Dovecote last night when a man reportedly burst into the property and then fired a number of shots through the door. Our reporter Sophie Reaper is uh, there for us. Sophie, police holding a pretty detailed news conference earlier. What more have we learned about what happened? Well, let me just tell you a little bit about last night. They, police were called to the residency behind me, or the street, should I say, behind me, at around 10 o'clock after reports that a man had fired a gun in one of the properties. When they arrived at the scene, police found nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell with a gunshot wound to her chest. She was rushed to hospital, but sadly died from her injuries. As you say, we've heard now from the police what they believe the sequence of events were. They say that last night two men were walking along this street when they were approached by a lone man holding a, a handgun. He shot at the two men who began to flee. Upon hearing the noise, Olivia's mum, Cheryl, opened their front door to try and see what the noise was. Upon seeing the front door opening, one of the men who was running away from the gunfire forced his way into the property in order to seek refuge. The man with the gun followed and managed to get his hand into the, gun, uh, into the front door as well. 
He then fired a shot which hit Cheryl in the wrist and then fired the shot that would prove fatal to Olivia. The attack then continued when he fired two shots which hit the man who had begun escaping from him. The attacker then left on foot. Now, Merseyside police have said a murder investigation has been launched and here's what they had to say at that press conference a little bit earlier today. I know that the murder of Olivia has rocked our communities, who are quite rightly upset and outraged that such an abhorrent crime has occurred here on the streets of Merseyside. The people of Liverpool and Merseyside are known for their compassion and pulling together in times of crisis. And I know that our communities, people are wanting to help the family in any way possible. This is not the time for anyone who knows who is responsible for this shooting to remain tight-lipped. It is time for our communities to come together with us and make Merseyside a place where the use of guns on our streets is totally unacceptable. And Sophie, what is the latest in the police inquiry? We can see it going on there, of course, still behind you. Clearly, this local community is going to be very shocked and will need a lot of reassurance. Yeah, you mentioned the community, and as you can probably see behind me, flowers have begun to be laid to commemorate the victim of this shooting. People have been coming out all day and, and talking to us about this incident, and one man told us that this community is very tight-knit and that they will do what it takes to find this person who is responsible. He also said that there's this typical gra uh, grass culture here in the region, but that, that has now gone out of the window, and they will do what it takes to find this man. Sophie, at the scene there, thank you very much indeed for updating us and uh, more from you, of course, a little later on. Well, Olivia's death comes after a spate of killings involving guns and knives on Merseyside. The same night as the shooting, a woman was found with a fatal stab wound in her chest in a pub car park in Kirby. On Sunday, a 28-year-old council worker, Ashley Dale, died after being shot in the Old Swan area of Liverpool. And, of course, not just a Merseyside. In London last week, 87-year-old Thomas O'Halloran stabbed to death while riding his mobility scooter in West London. And then within the last few days, this video from Nottingham going viral online, showing a group of youth storming a McDonald's restaurant in the city centre there, jumping over the counter and then stealing food and drink. Police say up to 50 people, thought to be aged between 14 and 16, abused and threatened staff there. But with conviction rates at an all-time low, at less than 6% at the moment, are we actually living in a lawless Britain that perhaps more resembles the Wild West? Let's get the thoughts now of Geoffrey DeMarco, the Assistant Director at Victim Support, joins us on the line. Geoffrey, thanks for joining us here on GB News. Um, a lot of people will be quite worried out there at seeing this, this increase and asking, is this an indication of things breaking down in Britain? Good afternoon and, and thank you for having us. And, you know, can we start by just sending out our condolences and our sympathies to all those that are being affected by some of these shocking, scary and atrocious stories that we're hearing across the country. I think it's really important to set the context quite clearly right now, which is that victims have the right to support and access to a wide, complex criminal justice system that serves their needs, that makes them feel listened to, that makes them feel treated with respect, with dignity, with equality, and that allows them to feel as if they are being represented. The problems that you're outlining and what we're seeing on the news right now are illustrative of a system that is in desperate need of additional resource. And when I say additional resource, I'm talking about ensuring that the police, the courts, the corrections facilities, the victim support organizations that are out there helping victims, their families and communities is provided with the right amount of investment to support those people through these tragic situations. Yeah. Is, is one of the particular difficulties, though, that much of this is gang related? And we heard the police there in Liverpool and Merseyside asking for people to come forward and, and not to be shy about doing so, even though there could be repercussions in doing that. 
and we understand that fear and that anxiety that is experienced, as you rightfully say, by wider communities in terms of retribution, in terms of kind of facing the consequences, should they want to work legitimately, openly and transparently with the authorities. What we would urge is that anybody that feels impacted either directly or indirectly by these types of violent offenses are able to seek independent support where they need so. So in this instance, anybody that feels touched by what we're seeing happening across the country, and in particular in Merseyside and in London at the moment, is that they can contact organizations such as our own where we can provide them with advice, with support around what their options are, and we would urge them that where they do feel confident and where they do feel as if they want to contribute to the ongoing investigations, that they do contact their police and they work with the police to help ensure that these types of things don't happen again. Yeah, well, uh, we all, uh, of course, applaud that. But from what you experience and what you see, I mean, are you getting the impression that we are becoming a more violent society? I wouldn't necessarily perceive it as us becoming a more violent society. It's important that the public know, and this is not dismissing anybody's lived experience, because it doesn't matter if you've been directly impacted by crime or not. If you are fearful, then society, the government, owes you a duty to allow you to contribute and to participate in society. So we often talk about this concept of fear of crime for individuals who have not directly experienced criminality or victimization. Those individuals are due support as well. And what we would urge, again, is that whilst the police and the wider criminal justice system are trying to do what they are there to do, that again, more investment is provided to them so that they can meet the needs of all of these victims. And, and perhaps we reflect at the moment, criminal barristers are about to go on strike because they've asked for more help and legal aid to pursue cases through the courts. That's not been forthcoming. They say they're withdrawing their services. Uh, we've not heard from the Justice Secretary, Dominic Raab. This is not a good picture of what some people have said uh, is a zombie government. Government. It's extremely disheartening, Mark. It's, it's, you know, there's this narrative that individuals waiting for their cases to be heard in court is a product of the barrister's strike or was a product of the pandemic. Well, yeah. I'm afraid that just simply isn't the case. These, these issues predate the pandemic and the strikes. We've had backlogs that exist for over a decade. And again, if the appropriate amount of investment is made into a fragile system that is dealing with these deep, structural difficulties, then we can at least start to do more in supporting those who need it most. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for bringing us your uh, view on that, Jeffrey. But uh, I'm just going to update uh, people now with some breaking news coming through. Within the uh, last few minutes, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has tweeted in response to Olivia's death, and he said, my thoughts are with Olivia Pratt Corbill's family and the people of Liverpool following this horrific, senseless shooting. This is an unimaginable tragedy, and we will ensure Merseyside police get whatever they need to catch those responsible and secure justice for Olivia. That statement just released by Number 10. Well, let's get some reaction to that with our political commentator joining us today. Emma Webb is with us for the next two hours. And Emma, um, clearly, the Prime Minister speaking there, perhaps we reflect as a father as well, where um, this poor, innocent girl is inside her own house and is hit by a bullet coming through the door. I mean, how on earth can you legislate with something like that? Uh, I mean, it is such a completely awful... Uh, story to read. The idea that this little girl was just standing at the bottom of her stairs and suddenly someone shoots her in her own home. But I think that, as we've seen with all of the other images that you've shown of, of the disorder and, and people's experiences of what is going on at the mo moment, I think people do feel that things are teetering um, on the brink of a, of a cr real crime explosion. And it's not just about having more investment and more, more money going into, say, the police force. It's about how that money is spent. And I think the problem is that people's experience of the police, including my own, over many, many years, is that the police don't actually respond properly to the crimes that you would expect they would. Crimes like burglary, theft, muggings, and things like that. We've seen footage only this week of a, a woman being mugged in the street and pinned down while she screams while another man tries to fight off her attackers that was filmed from, uh, from a window mm. by a witness. 
And I think that the fact is that this sends a message to criminals that the system works in their favour, that the police are not going to investigate these things. And instead, the police are seen to be spending taxpayer money and spending them, that, that money on resources that are not related to crime, related to things like non-crime hate incidents, for example, instead of actually enforcing what the law is meant to do, which is to protect property and to protect life. Yeah, and, and uh, particularly in these instances, knife and gun crime, of course, mm -hmm. which needs specific targets. Emma, thank you for the moment. You're with us for the, the afternoon, of course, bringing your view, uh, as you may well do on the latest in politics, because Tory leadership hopefuls Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak going head-to-head -head once more tonight in Birmingham. It's the latest Hustings event. Now, ahead of that meeting with Conservative members in Britain's second city, Liz Truss has vowed to put the West Midlands at the heart, she said, of the UK, uh, UK's economic revival. The Foreign Secretary saying she will encourage the private sector to get behind business in the heart of the country by pledging to deliver key infrastructure projects, including a Midlands rail hub and a battery gigafactory. In a statement, the leadership frontrunner saying, from Coventry's cars to Stokes ceramics, the West Midlands is a vital part of the UK's economic engine and plays host to some of the most innovative industries and companies in the country. Let's speak now to Councillor Myron Jenkins, who's a shadow cabinet member in Birmingham's City Council, uh, has a focus too on finance. Thank you very much indeed for speaking us, uh, to us on GB News, Myron. Um, we were expecting some kind of legacy after the Commonwealth Games. Is this an indication that if she does become new Prime Minister, that, that would be part of the first move? Yes. Um... Uh, obviously, I saw that uh, press release came out this morning, and whilst the, the detail is, is still emerging, it looks very promising. I think there's some, some good infrastructure improvements in terms of the rail hub, which improves travel east to west uh, across the Midlands, uh, and hopefully the, the ability to attract the investment in the battery factory. But what, what I particularly like as well is the investment zones, because one of the things that's really holding the economy back at the moment is, is the very high level of taxes that we have, the highest taxes in, in 70 years. Um, and, and I think what we need in the investment zones is, is to provide lower taxes, uh, lower red tape for businesses so that it encourages people to set up and grow businesses in these zones. Now, if it was left to me, the whole country would be an investment zone. But if we can't have that, let's have, at least have these investment zones in areas to which we need to attract prosperity. I'll ask you, where, where do you think the money will come from, though? Of course, uh, you will have to try and get some tax incentive, I guess, for people to uh, invest. But um, given the state of the economy, have we actually got any spare cash to, to do that? Uh, I, I think the question is not can we afford tax cuts, but can we not afford to do it? You know, the, the, the tax cut should not be seen as a reward for good performance. Um, the tax cut is the thing that generates economic activity that increases prosperity, increases the tax take, and therefore enables us to pay for the public services that we want. And, you know, it's, it's, we've seen um, many examples in the past where cuts in tax, and particularly cuts in corporation tax, have actually led to more tax revenue. So, so I think it's important that the new prime minister, at the very least, does not increase taxes as um, uh, is, is, is scheduled to take place at the moment, but I would like to see them taken back. And particularly um, in, the in, in the investment areas, I'd like to see taxes significantly reduced. But it's not just taxes, it's the burdens on business. Those things that make it hard to start and grow a business need to be significantly reduced. But can I just ask you, Councillor, what, what the situation is with the, the Gigafactory? I thought that had already been announced. It's not actually new, is that right? Uh, well, there's there's a, a plan to build several battery factories. I mean, if you compare the UK with China, they have many more battery factories, yeah. e even than the six that we might have if we build them. Um, it, it's not straightforward. We've seen from the example in, in Blythe that, uh, you know, the, that they're making progress, but there's been um, complications in terms of the personnel. But I, I think that the thing with this is that to, to, um, to, to attract the investment to build the factory, 
we, we need better investment environment. It's not just a question of giving in public money, subsidizing it and hope that it works. I think by, by making the investment more attractive and attracting mm. money into the country to do it, improving the chance that the factory can then be profitable in its own right. I think we're much more likely to see successful investments than if we talk about the state subsidizing these yeah, type of things. Yeah. I accept that something, for example, like the, the rail hub and the, the, the um, things that go with that, clearly those would have to be investments by the state. Councillor Marion Jenkins, thank you for joining us with your view there in Birmingham. Uh, let's uh, turn to Emma, who's still with us here in the studio. Um, is there an element with these hustings that you just tell each particular area you go to what they want to hear? Uh, the Northern Powerhouse, for instance, mm -hmm. seems to have disappeared. Could the same happen to the Midlands hub? Yeah, I think the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And the problem with a lot of the statements that Conservative um, leaders have repeatedly or come out... Or potential leaders, yeah. Or potential leaders yeah. um, have, have come out with with over the years haven't actually borne fruits for the North. Um, and one of the reasons for that is COVID, but that doesn't excuse the fact that this hasn't materialised. So I think that actually for people on the ground in the North, they'll be wanting to see actions, not words. Yeah. And I think as a result of, of that history, I think there's going to be very little faith in what either Rishi or Liz Truss uh, come out with uh, until there is some proof. Indeed. And, and Myron touched on an issue there about, you know, when you talk about transport infrastructure, a new rail hub, that will have to be state money. There ain't no state money at the moment. Absolutely. And I think, again, there's a problem um, in terms of the potential over-promising here because they may be setting themselves up to fail. Um, that given also the, the, the fact that I think there's probably very low trust in the North uh, in, in what they're saying. And also that any investment needs to be evidence-led. And at the moment, it seems as if both sides are just suggesting things that they think people want to hear, but not proving exactly how Costing that's going out, to yeah. work or yeah. whether whether that's going to have the consequences they hope it will. Yeah. Emma, thank you for the moment. Uh, more to come. Uh, you're watching Brazier with me, Mark Longhurst, in for Colin uh, this uh, Tuesday on GB News, on TV, online and, of course, digital radio. Still to come, the record for the number of channel migrants crossing in a single day has been smashed once again, with more than 1,000 being detected on small boats yesterday. And this comes as GB News has seen evidence that those trying to cross to the UK in the back of those lorries continues to be an everyday problem. Our home and security editor, Mark White, with us for the very latest. We're back in a moment. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Welcome back. You're watching and listening to Braze here with me, Mark Longhurst, uh, sitting in for Colin today here on GB News. Now, nearly 1,300 migrants crossed the English Channel in small boats this Monday. That's the largest number to cross in a single day and is part due to the flat, calm conditions and very light winds following the weekend. But it's not just boats that migrants are using to attempt to enter the UK because GB News has now witnessed alarming scenes demonstrating that those trying to cross in the back of lorries continues to be a huge problem. Our Home and Security editor, Mark White, has more. For those migrants who can't afford to pay the thousands of pounds for a small boat trip across the Channel, this is where you'll find them, hanging around the ferry ports of northwestern France just waiting for their chance to get into the port and onto the lorries. As we filmed through the gloom, the camera catches sight of a lone figure, difficult to make out as they walk between the trailers in this lorry park. Suddenly, another makes a dash for one of the trucks. They're looking for anywhere they can squeeze themselves into. Inside the trailer is ideal, but when you're determined, any space will do. Part of the driver's routine these days are regular checks of their vehicles. They face the risk of fines if anyone is found on board and they haven't gone through the proper checks. This group of migrants have been searching for anything they can find to help them scale the perimeter fence. Having found this wooden pallet, they're heading for a secluded enough spot to jump over. The French police are everywhere, and these young men know it, sneaking between the trailers, hoping to avoid detection within feet of the police patrols. Time and again, this migrant tried to jump onto lorries as they headed off to the port, disappearing out of view as this police van arrives. Another driver flags the officers down as he's heard people trying to get into his vehicle. He thinks they may have been on the roof. Migrants will often cut through the canvas on top to get into the trailer. Quite understandably, attention has been focused of late on the small boats crisis. It is a highly visible means of entering the UK, unlike the clandestine method of hiding in the back of a lorry. And the numbers crossing by small boat just continue to climb. On Monday, this year's record for those crossing in a single day, almost 700, was smashed as many more than that took advantage of perfect weather conditions in the Channel. But the issue of migrants trying to sell themselves on board vehicles has never gone away. Around 8,000 were detected in the past year in enhanced checks by border force at both French and UK ports. These checks require huge resources. The added impact of policing the channel for small boats at the same time only adds to the strain. And although we know about those detected inside lorries at ports, there are no estimates for the number who've managed to get through. Only if they're caught will many try to claim asylum. If they make it to the UK, most of these young men will end up working in the illegal economy. Mark White, GB News. Well, Mark, with the uh, latest on a continuing problem, let's get the views of Emma with us here in the studio. And, and Mark's been reporting on many aspects of this, including uh, the fact that the French were indicating they were going to try and get a grip on it. I mean, we saw a police van there um, with the incident with the lorries, but uh, there is a question about how much they are doing their side of the channel to stop them coming over. And, and we keep throwing more money at them and not seeing the results. In fact, the situation only seems to be getting worse. And I think 
ordinary people around the country will be looking at this and just thinking this situation is completely intolerable. We have no idea who's coming into our country. We don't know the numbers, as, as Mark has um, said there. We, we don't have estimates of who's coming in, over how many people are coming in over these lorries. Even when it comes to the small boats, we don't have the true figure of that. So actually, it could only be the tip of the iceberg when you add all of these numbers together. Yeah. And either you have these people going into the black um, market economy or they uh, go into the system and we therefore have to spend huge amounts of money um, on the asylum system. And actually, um, and this point has been already made quite widely, a lot of these people who are coming over are from places like Albania or yeah. Vietnam. These are not people fleeing So they're, they're the economic zone. migrants rather than people trying they to are. seek asylum. And yeah. the fact that they're coming from France, which is a safe country, means that they are not really um, asylum seekers in the sense that most people would, would regard somebody directly fleeing Afghanistan as somebody who would have a legitimate asylum claim. France is a place where they can claim asylum. The first country people, of refuge. But yeah. people want to come here because they, because of the language or because of economic reasons. Yeah. Emma, thanks very much. Uh, more to come, of course, with you. And to remind you, uh, I'm Mark Longhurst, sitting in for Colin uh, this uh, Tuesday on GB News, on TV, online and digital radio. And still to come, we'll be debating the big topic of the day, asking, should we scrap GCSEs and A-levels? Former Prime Minister Tony Blair, seen there in earlier days... Uh, thinking that we should, his institute says exams do far too little to meet the needs of the modern world. Analog learning for the digital age, he declared. So do we need to change the education system? That's coming up next. But first, let's bring you up to date with the latest news headlines. Here's Tatiana. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon. It is 4.34. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB newsroom. Police have named a nine-year-old girl who was shot dead in her home in Liverpool last night as Olivia Pratt Corbell. Police officers were called to a house in the Knotty Ash area last night after an unknown man forced his way into a home. Police say a shot was fired, which hit a woman, Olivia's mother, and then fatally wounded the child. The nine-year-old was shot in the chest and later died in hospital. Another man remains in hospital and police are asking for anyone with information to come forward. Their family are absolutely devastated, inconsolable and heartbroken. I know that the murder of Olivia has rocked our communities, who are quite rightly upset and outraged that such an abhorrent crime has occurred here on the streets of Merseyside. Ukraine is on high alert amid fears that Russia could escalate attacks ahead of the country's Independence Day tomorrow. Parts of the capital, Kiev, are lined with the wreckage of Putin's army. Public gatherings and events are banned there, and government employees have been told to work from home. Which is that no territory, no country... Industry leaders are warning households are facing a catastrophic winter amid soaring energy bills. EDF's managing director says half of UK families could be in fuel poverty come January when their energy prices are expected to reach £4,600. Conservative leadership candidate Rishi Sunak says he'll do all he can to support those that need it most. Cut VAT on energy bills to provide some help to everyone, but I want to provide direct financial assistance to two other groups of people, those on the lowest incomes and pensioners, because those people will need extra help this autumn winter. And I know things are difficult and I want them to be reassured that with me as Prime Minister, they will get the help that they need. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Brazier with Mark Longhurst. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle.
Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. You're watching and listening to Braze here with me, Mark Longhurst, sitting in for Colin today here on GB News. Now, we're all urged to learn the lessons of history, especially the politicians urge us to do that. And one of the most divisive politicians of the past 20 years, Tony Blair, returning to the theme just a day after our further education sector suggested that tuition fees should be raised to £13,000 a year for uni. Yes, that's right. It was a certain Tony Blair who suggested tuition fees were a fairer way to fund a university or college education than just handing out money in grants to needy students. But that policy is something today's undergraduates and graduates might question as they face repaying their loans at an interest rate of 6.6%, double what the mortgage rate is. Anyway, another lesson plan has now been released by the rather grandly entitled Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. His latest idea for education, 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 yes, the mantra of that 2001 radical education policy, is to scrap GCSEs and A-levels and replace them with regular assessments between the age of 16 and 18. Now, critics, of course, say such a system has led to grade inflation during lockdown as teachers were allowed to effectively mark their own success, not their failure. But Mr Blair's gone further this time, rather ironically calling for the curriculum to be taken out of the hands of the politicians. Instead of learning and remembering stuff, we need to instead concentrate on critical thinking, creativity, communication and collaborative problem solving. Yes, the four C's instead of the three R's. Well, it's an approach long debated by educationalists, but in what may be a warning from the past, yes, a history lesson, the reforming zeal in which the Blair Institute has cloaked this announcement. We are, warns the Institute for Global Change, pursuing analogue learning for a digital age, where the workplace is increasingly shaped by automation and artificial intelligence. Well, it's an echo, perhaps, of another previous mantra of his Labour government, the knowledge-based economy. Remember that? Where old-fashioned ideas of actually making things by bashing bits of metal led to a huge decline in manufacturing. Indeed, many in Birmingham tonight gathering for that latest Conservative leadership hustings may reflect on that particular lesson after our motorbike, car and associated industries all disappeared one by one. What price old-fashioned apprenticeships now, perhaps? So, when marking this latest paper, we might award the Blair Institute a B-. Good effort, but could do better, especially concentrate on the history a bit more. Let's just get the views of uh, Emma on that in terms of uh, lessons from history. Emma, I don't know if you're old enough to remember education or actually act went I was through the system. I was educated under Blair, yeah. actually. Um, and I, 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 don't, I don't want to be um, sort of crass, but I was sort of rolling my eyes at that because I think it's really the opposite of what we need. And as somebody who was educated under the Blair years, I actually think that we shouldn't be listening to anything that Tony Blair says when it comes to education. Particularly the fact that he wants to take this out of the hands of politicians, I found interesting. Because well, why, one of, why is that? One of the things that Tony Blair was um, very good at was in creating this, what has been now referred to as this quangocracy, all of yeah. these different 
uh, quangos that aren't accountable to the electorate. And so actually in doing so, Tony Blair is suggesting creating another such quango that would essentially be unaccountable I, I, from the description that has, be, has been given of it. Um, and it's very like, it seems likely to me, given the way that most of our institutions have gone, that this would have um, a very particular bent to it. Um, and I think I find that very worrying. But I can, also... can, I, can I just put it to you? I mean, I think I looked at your results. Did you have A3, three A stars in <laughs> your... Did. So something must have worked. Oh, well, I, I went to a school where I can guarantee that wasn't the that wasn't the standard in our sixth form college for certain. Right. Um, but I, I think that um, too, I think that too many people are going to university. I think that that was a big mistake, encouraging so many people to go to university. The, the destruction of everything you just described there of our in industries and the apprenticeships, mm. yeah, the yeah. knowledge based economy. I think that's led to a lot of the problems that we're currently facing. Um, and I also think that this emphasis, and I think it's he's right that we do have to adapt to to the, the changing of the, of the modern world. Yeah. But I think that those old skills, the reading, writing and arithmetic, the, the learning by and rote... learning the lessons of history. And that yeah. has a very, very important purpose. And I think all of this emphasis on creativity and so on, that's something that comes later once you've learnt facts. OK, there's our A-star student speaking. Uh, it brings us nicely on to the debate this hour. As you've just been hearing, uh, Sir Tony Blair calling for uh, Olysses Institute, GCSEs and A-levels to be scrapped since they leave children poorly prepared for work. Work. So we're asking, should A-levels and GCSEs GCSE, GCSE indeed be scrapped and what should replace them? We're joined by former political secretary to Tony Blair, no less, John McTernan, and chairman of the campaign for real education, Chris McGovern. Uh, let's just uh, speak first to uh, John here in the studio. Are you, are you a guilty man on this, John? I've never been guilty, um, but I agree with Tony. Um, and Tony's right. A-levels are an exam designed to find the top 5% of pupils for a time in the 50s when only 5% of kids went to university. Mm. That's not true. That's never going to be true again. 40%, uh, 50% of kids are going to university now. 60 or 70% of kids should go to university. This is the 21st century. It's not the 1950s. And we should take away the exam that was designed to weed out 95% of kids and create something that educates 100% of kids. Right, OK. Well, let's bring in uh, Chairman of the Campaign for Real Education, Chris McGovern. Chris, thanks for joining us. Uh, what should real education be, then? Well, first of all, telling the truth. And, and what Tony Blair has written today in the Daily Telegraph is about as opposite from the truth as you could possibly get. For example, he wants to soft-soap the teachers to bring them on board. So he writes in the, in the newspaper, but over the last 25 years, there's been a significant improvement in standards in our schools. In fact, we're the only country in the developed world where grandparents outperform their grandchildren according to have lost the signal for a moment. Uh, we'll try and re-establish that. But let's uh, turn back to, to John here uh, in the studio. And, and John, clearly he took a lot of stick uh, mm. for a lot of the education policies. But was it right to try and change things? Because no. clearly there was a, a question mark as to whether exam results were really showing the ability what, of yeah, what so, so there's been a lot of continuity in education policy since the Baker reforms uh, in, the, in the 80s. So the independence, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the independence of schools under their head teachers, consistent from uh, from Baker under Thatcher right through to to nowadays actually Michael Gove under uh, under Cameron, mm. that consistency of giving power to head teachers, I think that's right. Also, the national curriculum brought in uh, James Callaghan launched the debate, brought in by the Tories, still have a national curriculum, and so the question is, in the end, do we want? our kids to be ready to work in a world which is dominated by AI and machine learning and be able to work in those contexts and also add what is the creativity that the people bring to the, 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 to the yeah. job. Yeah, is, is the danger with doing that? They, they stop thinking for themselves and individually and all this, the issue of, of we're told you go to university to explore not just the knowledge yeah. but yourself as well. Well, the, the, great, the great thing about universities is so many unintended consequences. You know, people get relationships, people form bands, yeah. people start to, um, uh, to as, as Tony you know, Blair did. Set up, also, yes, and people set up <laughs> Unfortunately, businesses. Unfortunately, yeah. um, and, and people's friendship groups from university yeah. are still powerful. Those networks are really powerful through through life and through the economy. So I think the thing is, do we need to keep forcing our kids into a GCSE uh, system right. when kids are staying on till eighteen? Uh, okay. No. 
Let's, let's, let's get back to Chris, because I think we can re-establish yeah. links uh, with Chris. Chris, uh, we can see you again and hear you, hopefully. There you are. Um, you, you were saying that you, you weren't very impressed with um, Sir Tony's latest ideas. He couldn't state the opposite of the truth with greater confidence. He talks about the the improvement in standards to bring teachers on site. But actually, if you look at the OEC, the so-called OECD, the, the great number crunchers, look at the, what are called PISA tests. They're done every three years. We've actually at a lower level now than we were back in 2003, both in numeracy and in mathematics. According to that organisation, the OECD, we're running about three years behind Singapore in basic mathematics. So there is certainly a crisis in education, and Tony Blair is right to focus on that. But the solution is coming up with is actually more teacher assessment, it would appear, modules and teacher assessment. If anything is going to run this country down and the education system down, it's having teachers deciding what grades children should have. We've seen that in the last two years. What we've got to do is get the basics right. And that, therefore, we should have options. We should have certainly keep the A-levels. We can change the A-levels, make it tougher, in my view. Or we could even do what Tony Blair perhaps wouldn't want to do, although back when he was the shadow, shadow minister for trade and industry, he wrote to us at the campaign back in the 80s. We pointed out to him that when the O-level, which is a tougher grammar school exam, has been abolished, all the exam boards were, were going along with that, and they were running a cartel. He wrote to us and said, well, they may be running a cartel, but you must, you must explain or prove it was against the public interest. So he knows about O-Level. In Singapore, where they, where they are at the top of the international league tables for education, they still do the O-Level, which is the most, we would say, the most old-fashioned of exams. So rather, And I don't know who Tony Blair thinks is going to teach this wonderful new curriculum, because we haven't got a teaching force up to scratch either. We've got a crisis in education, so I welcome the fact that Tony Blair's getting involved in the talk, but actually he needs to stop the nonsense. We're in a real problem, and, and we've got to get back to some basics. We've got to improve the quality of our teaching. We've got too many youngsters going from primary school into secondary school, can't read and write. They walk the green mile to no qualifications, no job, no future. We're an underskilled nation, and Tony Blair's prob uh, solution will underskill us even more. But he is, talks isn't... about all these problems. Isn't that the very point he's making, that we are underskilled and the way to, to uh, achieve that, as he said, are the four C's, critical thinking, creativity, communication and collaborative problem solving, i.e. not learning by rote and then writing it down on a piece of paper in a, a two-hour exam? Yeah, look, today's problem with yesterday's solution, we said exactly the same in the 80s about O-level. The fact is you've got to deliver these things. And when he talks about creativity, what does he actually mean? We could say Shakespeare was quite creative. He went to a traditional grammar school. Mozart was quite creative. He was traditionally taught you have to get the basics in place. So, yes, of course you want creativity. Of course you want these skills. What we've got, what we've got to look at is the quality of the teaching. And we haven't got good enough teaching. We've got some great teachers. I taught for 35 years. We have some great teachers. Not good enough. And the idea of leaving teachers in charge and taking it away from politicians is nonsense. The teachers have made a mess of it. If you want to see Tony Blair's monument to education, look around you. Look at where we are. We are way behind the rest, much of the rest of the world. We're not competing. And so we do need reform, but we don't need the reform Tony Blair's suggesting. We need rigour, we need good teaching, and then we need higher standards, not this right. dumbing down. Let, let, me, let me put an alternative point of view to John. If we are so bad, why is it so many international students want to come and visit our universities? Look, I think... uh, that, that, are you asking me? Well, well, I was going to put that to John, because clearly that, that's an that's alternative view to, to yours, uh, Chris. Yeah, look, I think there's an issue, which is um, Tony's not been Prime Minister for 15 years, so it can't really be his fault, the state of current education. There is, as I said, a, an agenda that's been shared by Tory and Labour governments alike, which is we have to properly staff schools, we have to have move to a graduate profession, we have to get more people to stay on at school to 18, uh, it's virtually we've raised the school leaving age. We've got to move to more rigorous curriculum in places, more rigorous testing. We need the right kind of testing for people. And the right, I mean, te teaching to be a great profession, the, the best and brightest aspire to be in, rather than going into to the banks and the financial sector. Mm. But the proof, in, the, in a sense, is what you're saying. It, it, it's in the pudding. Our universities attract global talent. Our challenge is to get that global talent to stay here after it graduates, after postgraduate, after postdoctoral work, so that we actually get the benefits of the spin-offs. And the, the biggest, biggest economic driver in Sunderland at the moment, apart from uh, the car factory, is probably the university and the science spin-offs and the learning spin-offs. And so we need to get better at integrating education and skills into the economy. But look, absolutely, education has a vital uh, thing to play for individuals 
to teach them the facts, teach them the basics, and then let, set them on a journey where they can have a full life and a creative life. And ask that question, why? That's all journalists do, of course. But, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for bringing us your view and uh, putting your question as to why. Thanks very much indeed. Now, time for 5 to 5 as we discuss five things you need to know before 5 o'clock. At 5, an amber warning for traffic being issued for the coming bank holiday weekend. It's thought that nearly half of the UK's drivers could be hitting the roads over the three-day period. The AA expecting leisure traffic to peak on Saturday between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. precisely. You've been warned. Uh, four, a 20-minute daily brain zapping session could boost older people's memories by up to 50%. That's what it looked like afterwards. That's according to scientists from Boston University. They've conducted a study involving over 65s being given a cap that applied electrical currents to two regions of their brains. Participants saw boost to their short-term memory. Don't try it at home. At three, NASA's Artemis mission has been given the all-clear to launch. The American Space Agency ready to send the rocket into space next Monday. Officials have conducted a flight readiness review, no less, and found no substantive technical issues in their way, they say. So the mission will send a capsule called Orion for an excursion round the moon. Moon landings to come later. At two... A 130-foot-long superyacht has sunk off the coast of Italy after starting to take on water late last night. The vessel Saga hit trouble while sailing to the island of Sicily. She began taking on water at the stern, and then that happened. All nine of the boat's crew and passengers, though, rescued safely. She is now under the waves. And at one, research suggests dogs cry happy tears when their owners return home. They're the only animal known to be capable of crying when happy. The study from Japanese scientists, he doesn't look very happy, found dogs become overwhelmed with emotion due to the release of oxytocin, which causing feelings of love and affection. Ah. Those are the five things you might want to know before five o'clock this afternoon, especially if you've got a dog. Emma, we have to ask, have you got a dog? I don't. My parents have a dog. Right. I, ha I have a cat, but I am very much a dog person. And what happens when you go home and the dog sees oh, you? He's definitely crying some happy tears, I really? think. Really? Right. When I, It sounds very silly, but when I read this story earlier, I actually felt a little bit emotional at the thought. <laughs> um, and I, it's just a shame that I don't think cats can do that. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I guess it underlines that man's best or woman's best friend, that there is some kind of bond that we have with these animals. There is something um, beautiful about the fact that dogs and human beings have in many ways evolved together. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, oxytocin is described as being the, the cuddle hormone. And so the idea that a dog could be so happy that his owner has come home, um, that it would, yeah. it, would, it would physically cry happy tears. And I guess measuring really the happy. other way, that do we release our own oxytocin when we <laughs> see, the, see the pet when we come home? It's, and it's, you know, it's supposed it, to be good for our well-being. It affects pretty badly on us that we don't cry when we see our dogs well, when we come true. home from work. <laughs> Emma, for the moment, uh, thank you for that. As to remind you, you're watching Brazier with me, Mark Long, who's standing in today for Colin here on GB News. Plenty more to come in the next hour. Stay with us. Uh, first, a look at the latest weather. I'm Alex Deakin with your latest weather update from the Met Office. A dry evening for most out there. Quite warm and humid overnight. We are going to see some wet weather, though, arriving in the west. Here's the bigger picture. Low pressure dominating up to the northwest. Weather fronts have been crossing the UK, but not providing much in the way of rainfall. This little bump, however, in this weather front is going to provide some of the soggy stuff this evening, pushing into southwest Wales initially, but then through the night becoming more widespread across Wales, eventually into northern England and southern Scotland. Ahead of that, one or two heavy showers here and there this evening, but they're tending to fade away. Much of eastern England, most of southern England will stay dry, and it's really going to be quite a warm, humid, muggy night with temperatures in urban areas across England and Wales staying in the high teens in places. A little cooler further north, but even here, a pretty warm start to Wednesday, and for many a wet start across parts of Scotland, northern England, and it's actually going to be a pretty wet day for parts of southwest Wales. That rain likely to linger, some bright colours there, some quite heavy rain. And it pushes back across north Wales into northern England come the afternoon. Either side of that rain band, again drier, cooler day for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but pleasant in the sunshine, but a hot one across East Anglia in the southeast. 30 Celsius is possible here. As we go through Wednesday evening, we're likely to see further pulses of rain across West Wales, South West England, could be quite heavy. And then overnight, 
There's the possibility of some thundery showers coming up across East Anglia in the southeast, where, of course, we could do really do with some heavy rain. And that may well still be around on Thursday. Some uncertainty about the details of that. So keep up to date with the forecast. We could see those thunderstorms gradually ebbing away during Thursday. A few showers in the northwest. Otherwise, many places dry and bright on Thursday. And for many, a fresher feel as well. Still pretty warm in the southeast with mid-20s, but generally high teens, low 20s and we'll start to lose that humidity with some good spells of sunshine. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics <laughs> because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there and welcome to Brazier with me, Mark Longhurst, sitting in for Colin today. Coming up live at five, police have named a nine-year-old girl who died after being shot in her own home in Liverpool as Olivia Pratt Corbell, and her death comes after a spate of killings involving guns and knives on Merseyside. This also comes just days after the murder of a man in his 80s stabbed to death on his mobility scooter in London. Not just killings either. Criminals appear to be running riot in our towns and cities. Just this weekend, this group of teenagers storming a McDonald's restaurant in Nottingham city centre. They jumped over the counter to steal food and drink. So we're asking, are we living in a lawless society? Is Britain becoming broken? Tory leadership hopeful Liz Truss has backed the West Midlands, pledging to make the heart of the country a focus in the economic revolution. She's been speaking ahead of going head-to-head -head with her rival Rishi Sunak at a hustings event in Birmingham tonight. We'll be speaking to a business leader in the city to find out how the region could unlock its potential. And in the debate this hour, we're asking, should the royals try to be normal? The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge moving to Windsor, with sources close to the couple claiming they want to give their kids a normal upbringing. And joining us once more for the next hour, political commentator Emma Webb is with us here in the studio. You're very welcome. First, though, the latest news headlines with Tatiana. Good afternoon. It is one minute past five. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB newsroom. We start with some breaking news. A woman who was reported missing nearly eight weeks ago has been found safe and well. The Met Police say 24-year-old student nurse Owami Davies was found in Hampshire. She was last seen walking in Croydon in early July and concern had been growing for her safety. The Met says Ms Davies had been found as a result of a call to police from someone who'd seen media appeals. 
Police have named a nine-year-old girl who was fatally shot in her home in Liverpool last night as Olivia Pratt Corbell. Officers were called to a house in the Knotty Ash area last night after an unknown man who was being chased by a gunman forced his way into her home. Police say shots were fired, they hit a woman, Olivia's mother, and then fatally wounded the child who was standing behind her. In the last hour, the schoolgirl's head teacher has paid tribute, saying the community is devastated. A manhunt is underway and police are asking for anyone with information to come forward. Their family are absolutely devastated, inconsolable and heartbroken. I know that the murder of Olivia has rocked our communities, who are quite rightly upset and outraged that such an abhorrent crime has occurred here on the streets of Merseyside. The Prime Minister has paid tribute to Olivia, condemning what he calls a horrific and senseless shooting. Boris Johnson says he wanted to secure justice for the nine-year-old after what he described as an unimaginable tragedy. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer says his thoughts are with Olivia's family after the devastating news for them and their community. The head teacher of Olivia's school added she had a beautiful smile, a lovely sense of humour and a bubbly personality. Ukraine is on high alert amid fears that Russia could escalate attacks ahead of the country's Independence Day tomorrow. Parts of the capital, Kyiv, are lined with the wreckage of Putin's army. Public gatherings and events are banned there and government employees have been told to work from home. Prime Minister Boris Johnson promised unwavering support for the people of Ukraine during an international conference on Russian-occupied Crimea. Which is that you will never recognise Russia's annexation of Crimea or any other Ukrainian territory. In the face of Putin's assault, we must continue to give our Ukrainian friends all the military, humanitarian, economic and diplomatic support that they need. A record number of channel migrants have crossed the English Channel in a single day. Nearly 1,300 were detected on small boats yesterday. It comes as GB News saw evidence that those trying to cross to the UK in the back of lorries also continues to be an ongoing problem. In the past year, official figures reveal around 8,000 people were detected at UK ports having illegally crossed the channel. Industry leaders are warning households are facing a catastrophic winter amid soaring energy bills. EDF's managing director says half of UK families could be in fuel poverty come January when the energy prices could reach £4,600. Conservative leadership candidate Rishi Sunak says he'll do all he can to support those that need it most. I cut VAT on energy bills to provide some help to everyone, but I want to provide direct financial assistance to two other groups of people, those on the lowest incomes and pensioners, because those people will need extra help this autumn and winter. And I know things are difficult, and I want them to be reassured that with me as Prime Minister, they will get the help that they need. Meanwhile, Liz Truss says she will put the West Midlands at the heart of her economic revival if she becomes Prime Minister. Ahead of the Conservative Party hustings in Birmingham this evening, Ms Truss revealed her plan to support businesses through lower taxes. The West Midlands is the latest area to be declared in drought. Officials are warning that despite recent rain, sustained wet weather in the coming months is needed to tackle the problem. It now means 10 out of 14 regions in England that the Environment Agency covers are now in drought. Three of these are classed as being in a state of prolonged dry weather, with Cumbria and Lancashire the only areas with normal water resources. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Brazier. Tatiana, thank you very much for that. Well, as we've just been seeing, the Tory leadership hopefuls Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak going head-to-head -to -head tonight in Birmingham in the latest hustings event for the leadership. Ahead of that meeting with Conservative members in Britain's second city, of course, Liz Truss, uh, vowing to put the West Midlands at the heart, she said, of the UK's economic revival. The Foreign Secretary is saying she will encourage the private sector to get behind business in the heart of the country 
pledging to deliver key infrastructure projects, including a Midlands rail hub and a battery gigafactory. In a statement, the leadership frontrunner said this, from Coventry's cars to Stoke Ceramics, the West Midlands is a vital part of the UK's economic engine and plays host to some of the most innovative industries and companies in the country. Let's get some reaction to that. Uh, uh, Naeem Arif, rather, is the vice president of the Sutton Coalfield Chamber of Commerce and owns a number of businesses in the West Midlands. Thanks very much for joining us here on on GB News. Um, What did you make of her pledges? Um, A a sort of empty hope, or do you think there's going to be real substance behind it? Uh, Well, you hope there's going to be real substance, um, but the reality is we need, I think, a bit of encouragement, enthusiasm, Uh, A lot of the economy is driven on confidence and um, telling people ahead of potential energy crisis, you know, that's the word that's being used all the time, that we're not going to have any money, doesn't give people a lot of confidence to spend. And I think business owners who have had um, Brexit, who have had uh, the high street crisis, lockdown, business owners really need right now in August to hear uh, confident people out on the high streets spending money, not just in shops, but in all businesses. And is it the case now that it's not big manufacturers that are left in this area? It's a lot of smaller businesses who've managed to sort of thrive uh, on their own. And therefore, as you say, they're really going to be hit by these these bigger bills. I think it affects both. Uh, I mean, there's there's over 5 million SMEs, uh, business owners out there in in the UK, and they employ a huge amount of of people. So, yes, the larger organisations maybe can draw on more reserves, and more financial support, um, but it's the smaller business owners and the SME, you know, category employs up to fifty people. It's these guys who need that support, and it's these guys who really um, we need to not forget when worrying about just your large manufacturing. These guys need support as well. Uh, and you've not heard anything from either candidate, and exactly what that help's going to be so far. No, I think you know at this stage there there are going to be a lot of promises made and. Potentially, not all the promises are going to be fulfilled. Uh, but certainly, you know, from my point of view, it's it's a bit refreshing to see that we are going to be a bit more positive. Uh, we certainly don't want to go back to austerity. Uh, we want to see uh, growth. We want to see drive in the economy. Uh, and as I say, we're in August now. But we're coming up to the golden quarter. Uh, a lot of businesses expect to do a lot of trade over the next three or four months on the run-up to Christmas. And we need to be getting that message out to those consumers that, it's not doom and gloom. We are going to support you. And, um, you know, we want to have a great Christmas for everybody. Well, there's a thought, yes. Uh, but what about the, the bigger picture then? She's talked about this sort of uh, Midlands hub with uh, more state money, we assume, spent on uh, a rail hub. I mean, that's, that's a more of a long-term hope, isn't it? Long-term project. Yeah, it's it's a long term project. It will filter some uh, some more uh, econ- uh, some more money into the local economy, uh, but I think at the moment the the talk leveling up. We've been talking about it for a long time. We want to see more drive in the Midlands. We want to see more support, government government incentives, grant to drive organisations and businesses into the Midlands, because if we have those locally, then we will drive more money into the economy and it will ensure that people are not worried about their jobs so much and they will have that confidence to spend over the next few months, which is what I think is going to help flatten out this uh, recession that we're definitely going to have. Yeah, and uh, as you say, perhaps be a bit more positive and uh, look towards Christmas with some sort of optimism. But, Naeem, thank you very much for your view there uh, from Sutton Coalfield Chamber of Commerce. Let's just remind you, Emma is still with us here in the studio. And, uh, I mean, you know, Liz Truss is quite right. Uh, Midlands was the engine room of the British economy. But that's when we were a manufacturing nation and we used to make things and sell it abroad. That's not really the case anymore, is it? We're still trying to respond to the, the hole that was filled with the decline of manufacturing. And I think that the North and the Midlands as well in particular are still really struggling with this. And I, I do think that it's right to focus on these small businesses as your guest just mentioned there, because they are the cornerstone of the economy. So many people are employed in these businesses. They are what form our high streets. And so when you hear Rishi Sunak, for example, talking about becoming this you know, this, this uh, sort of 
gleaming light of scientific activity. Actually, what people really want and what people need right now in this cost of living crisis is they need the high street to flourish. They need these small businesses to flourish. Coming out of everything that happened with COVID, they've suffered hugely mm. as a result of that. And so I think that Liz Truss uh, is right to put an emphasis on the economy, the local economy in the Midlands and in the North. My concern is that it's all talk and that it's not going to lead to action yet mm. again. Yeah, uh, very quickly, I mean, she indicated these investment zones, which we assume will be sort of tax relief or, or, or in, in, uh, investment relief of some kind. Um, that, again, takes time to sort of feed through the system, doesn't it? It does, and I, I think Liz Truss in many ways has modelled her economic policies on Margaret Thatcher, and in, in, in that respect, one way of doing this would be to simply lower taxes for these businesses, get rid of all of the red tape that's holding yeah, them yeah. back, and try to help them to flourish that way rather than borrowing money and then investing it. Which is, of course, the big battle between Sunak and Trust on, on the way forward. But, Emma, thanks very much indeed for being with us this afternoon. Now, let's uh, reflect on that awful story uh, up in Liverpool with Merseyside Police this afternoon naming the nine-year-old girl who was shot uh, dead in Liverpool last night as Olivia pratt Corbel, the nine-year-old killed shortly after 10pm after a 35-year-old man being chased by another man with a gun forced his way into a house. As a mum struggled to close the door, she was also shot and injured. Well, here's what Chief Constable Serena Kennedy had to say at a news conference a little earlier in Liverpool. I know that the murder of Olivia has rocked our communities, who are quite rightly upset and outraged that such an abhorrent crime has occurred here on the streets of Merseyside. The people of Liverpool and Merseyside are known for their compassion and pulling together in times of crisis. And I know that our communities, people are wanting to help the family in any way possible. This is not the time for anyone who knows who is responsible for this shooting to remain tight-lipped. It is time for our communities to come together with us and make Merseyside a place where the use of guns on our streets is totally unacceptable. Within the past hour, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson has issued an, a statement in response to Olivia's death. Uh, he said in the tweet, my thoughts are with Olivia pratt Corbel's family and the people of Liverpool following this horrific, senseless shooting. He went on to say, this is an unimaginable tragedy and we will ensure that Merseyside police get whatever they need to catch those responsible and to secure justice for Olivia. That being issued by uh, number 10. Well, uh, the death comes after a spate of killings involving guns and knives on Merseyside on the same night as uh, this shooting. A woman found with a fatal stab wound in her chest in a pub car park in Kirby. On Sunday, 28-year-old council worker Ashley Dale dying after being shot in the Old Swan area of Liverpool. And just not uh, in Merseyside too, of course, you remember in London last week, 87-year-old Thomas O'Halloran stabbed to death while riding on his mobility scooter in West London. And within the past few days, video from Nottingham going viral online, showing a group of youths storming a McDonald's restaurant in the city centre, jumping over the counter to steal food and drink. Police saying up to 50 people, thought to be aged between 14 and 16, abusing and threatening staff. Well, shortly we'll speak to the Police and Crime Commissioner for Hampshire, Donna Jones. But first, let's get uh, your views, lots of them coming in on this particular issue. Uh, first of all, Ian, uh, who says increasing crime is just one more part of the 12 years of Tory misgovernment. NHS trashed, immigration trashed, justice system trashed, honesty in government trashed, energy trashed, United Kingdom trashed, he says. Uh, Jill, I believe we are dealing with loads of antisocial behaviour due to TikTok dares. There are loads of dares telling kids to perform various types of assault, criminal damage, etc. If you challenge them on it, they tell you they're just having fun. We are constantly getting our doors kicked in, houses being egged, people have been pushed into the river and canal. The police are doing what they can, but they can't be everywhere 24-7. TikTok needs to be policed or shut down, says Jill. Uh, John now. The reason gangs are being emboldened is because the police are not policing anymore. They're too busy virtue signalling and dancing the Macarena. Of course, that's the video that we saw in Lincoln City Centre at a Pride event. It's an absolute disgrace, he says, that coppers can investigate a tweet, but...
but no one is available for serious crimes. Well, uh, keep those views coming and uh, we'll reflect them and um, we'll uh, maybe have a few more uh, points of view on what the police should be doing. Well, let's get uh, Emma's view on this because you were nodding in agreement with quite a few of those sentiments coming in. Um, I, I guess it, it's trying to actually find out whether it's a failure of policing or a failure of society in general. I, I'm very worried by the way that I've been reading in the, in, the, in the papers in response to this over the last week or so, that a lot of this disorder is to do with the cost of living crisis. Mm. I think that that is uh, an excuse for the behaviour that we're seeing. I think that it has a lot to do um, with what the viewer just mentioned there about police not spending their time policing. And the reference there I expect to them policing a tweet uh, was a, a gentleman who was recently arrested because he'd put something online that someone was offended by. And when the police came to arrest him, they couldn't tell him what he was being arrested for. They simply told him, and it's on video, they told him that it was because he'd caused anxiety to someone. Mm. So I think that people are seeing the police doing things like the Macarena, dancing at Pride um, parades, wearing high-heeled shoes and doing all sorts of things you wouldn't think the police should be doing. Although the chief constable was saying it was, you know, to engender good community relations, that there was a point to it. But I think that when you're when you're facing a situation where burglaries and muggings are not having any police time spent on them, really, to speak of. I mean, I, I myself had my bike stolen during lockdown in 2020, and I was told by the police to look for my own bike on Gumtree. So people are experiencing this all of the time. When I put that on Twitter, I had responses in the hundreds from people, well, people both online and experience. offline, who had had hideous experiences, like having three motorbikes stolen in a very short period of time, um, all, all sorts of things where the police were simply not able or, or, or may, perhaps didn't want to respond because they were spending their resources, which is public money, spending their time on other things. Mm. And so I think a lot of this is, has something to do with the fact that the police have sent the message to criminals that if they do things like mug someone in the street or steal someone's property, they're going to get away with it. And so you then see scenes like this. Only on Monday I saw someone get mugged outside of a co-op. And the person who was mugged said to me when I when I spoke to him afterwards said that he wasn't going to get knifed for a steak and didn't even phone the police because people know that they're not going to get an adequate the, response. Yeah, and and the fear that uh, obviously um, if you do intervene, it, it could end badly, as as we've seen some of these circumstances. Precisely, and people can't take it into their own hands, but they yeah. don't trust the police will deal with it either. Yeah. yeah. Uh, OK, uh, let's uh, reflect on the fact that uh, we've got um, the economists warning that energy prices could be pushing inflation as high as 18 percent in the next year. We'll be reflecting more on that. Can it get any worse? We'll be finding out. I'm Alex Deakin with your latest weather update from the Met Office. A dry evening for most out there. Quite warm and humid overnight. We are going to see some wet weather, though, arriving in the west. Here's the bigger picture. Low pressure dominating up to the northwest. Weather fronts have been crossing the UK, but not providing much in the way of rainfall. This little bump, however, in this weather front is going to provide some of the soggy stuff this evening, pushing into southwest Wales initially, but then through the night becoming more widespread across Wales, eventually into northern England and southern Scotland. Ahead of that, one or two heavy showers here and there this evening, but they're tending to fade away. Much of eastern England, most of southern England will stay dry. And it's really going to be quite a warm, humid, muggy night with temperatures in urban areas across England and Wales staying in the high teens in places. A little cooler further north, but even here, a pretty warm start to Wednesday. And for many, a wet start across parts of Scotland, northern England, and it's actually going to be a pretty wet day for parts of southwest Wales. That rain likely to linger, some bright colours there, some quite heavy rain. And it pushes back across North Wales into northern England come the afternoon. Either side of that rain band, again, drier, cooler day for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but pleasant in the sunshine, but a hot one across East Anglia in the southeast. 30 Celsius is possible here. As we go through Wednesday evening, we're likely to see further pulses of rain across West Wales, South West England could be quite heavy. And then overnight, there's the possibility of some thundery showers coming up across East Anglia in the southeast, where, of course, we could do really do with some heavy rain. And that may well still be around on Thursday. Some uncertainty about the details of that. So keep up to date with the forecast. We could see those thunderstorms gradually ebbing away during Thursday. A few showers in the northwest. 
otherwise many places dry and bright on Thursday, and for many, a fresher feel as well. Still pretty warm in the southeast with mid-20s, but generally high teens, low 20s, and we'll start to lose that humidity with some good spells of sunshine. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Very warm welcome back to Brazier with me, Mark Longhurst, sitting in for Colin uh, this uh, Tuesday here on GB News. Now, let's update you on the economic picture uh, with the warning that rising energy prices could push UK inflation as high as 18.6% next year. That's the highest rate for nearly 50 years. Now, inflation, the rate, of course, at which prices uh, increase, hit 10.1% in July, five times the Bank of England's target. Now, the investment bank City said inflation was entering the stratosphere. Even the usually cautious Bank of England predicted that inflation could be rising to more than 13% in the coming months. That looks a pretty conservative estimate now, conservative with a small c, perhaps. Well, we're joined now by Susanna Street, Senior Investment and Markets Analyst at Hargreaves Lansdowne. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, there does seem to be a, a really big problem here for both any new government and the Bank of England. And the main driver at the moment seems to be this wholesale gas price. And increasing interest rates is not really going to have a grip on that. It just makes the idea of perhaps uh, some kind of prolonged recession even more likely. So let's unpick that a little bit. So let's talk about what's really driving that forecast of 18%. Yes, you're right to say, of course, that we've seen um, wholesale gas prices rise. They've spiked again um, recently over concerns about supplies from Russia. Uh, but remember, it's also the way the energy market um, is uh, is organised here in the UK and the price cap that has been set, which is um, higher um, here in the UK than in other uh, European countries. And that is why City is forecasting this uh, rate of inflation of 18% for the UK. And remember uh, that 10.1% um, rise in inflation that we've, we've seen, the latest reading, well, that is higher than other G7 nations. So it's the peculiar difference of the UK as well, not just wholesale energy prices, that accounts for this really frightening forecast. Yeah, wh why is that? Because we keep being told we're not as reliant on, uh, Germ uh, on uh, Russian gas as Germany, for instance. And yet, as you say, we do seem to be uh, racing ahead. I mean, is there a bit of profiteering going on here? It's... 
as you say, around 9% of gas uh, has relied on Russia for that. Uh, but of course, the price is set on the wholesale market. And uh, with the European futures prices racing ahead, um, UK gas prices are lower, but they're still uh, back at the levels that we saw in February. Um, so that partly accounts for it, but it's also what's feeding in is the energy bills customers pay. And of course, that's uh, on how the energy market is run here in Britain compared to other countries. And that is why you are getting uh, lots of different bosses from energy companies saying, look, we have to pr pay these wholesale prices, but actually what we need now is more targeted support, be it in the form of loans, um, perhaps to ensure to those energy companies that they don't have to pass on the full price of those wholesale rises in costs to yeah. uh, consumers. We, we've had Keir Starmer indicating that Labour would go for this price freeze on, on energy bills and using a, a backdated windfall tax to pay some of that. They tried it in France, where they've actually got uh, a state energy company, EDF. EDF ended up suing the French government as a result. So does that even work? Well, EDF is now um, set to become nationalised uh, by the French government. Certainly what we do need is some more targeted support um, for those people who really are going to be struggling with their energy bills. Um, and I certainly think that right now tax cuts aren't the best thing to implement because not only um, will it go counter to what the Bank of England is trying to do, which is dampen down demand in the economy, it's likely to mean interest rates will have to rise even further to try yeah, and bring yeah. down inflation, but it, you won't have as much money left to try and offer that support to those people who are really struggling. And what? take your small business owner a little bit earlier in the programme saying what they need right now is some consumer confidence. You're not going to get consumer confidence if people feel that they cannot afford to heat their homes. They're not going to be going out to support the high street, to support small businesses. So I think that has got to be really looked at to see where support really is needed in the economy right when, now. And tax yeah. cuts across the board just isn't going to cut it. But, but that begs the next question. Where does that support come from uh, in terms of whether you call it a handout or whatever else? Because clearly there was uh, understood to be some £30 billion headroom in the economy, i.e. is a piggy bank available. The OBR, Office of Budget Responsibility, is saying it could be half that or, or even less at the moment. The money's just not there to, to be able to, to pay out. Well, if the money's not there to pay out right now, there'll be even less money to pay out if you cut taxes and reduce yeah. the amount of revenue going into government coffers. So it will make the situation even worse going forward. And remember as well uh, the number of uh, public sector workers going out on strike. They're saying they simply cannot afford to pay uh, for a standard, a reasonable standard of living with inflation shooting sky high and their wages not keeping pace. And uh, there are real concerns about public services and maintaining the standard of public services as well. So certainly all of these things have to be paid for somewhere. And if you're going to be cutting taxes, there isn't going to be enough money left for targeted support for those sectors of the population who right. really need it to so, support the wider economy as well. So do we borrow? I think uh, the last uh, estimate was £2.4 is is government debt. I mean, you know, do we add yet more to that bill? Well, you could just not cut taxes. Um, that could be another alternative right now, uh, rather than borrowing to cut taxes. Um, I think certainly right now, tax cuts for now should be off the table and the immediate um, financial resilience of many millions of households up and down the country should be the priority. Those mm. households are in the poorest across society, rather than cutting taxes for all sections of the population. Yeah. Susanna, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us and uh, taking us through that. Uh, but let's see what Emma uh, makes of it, because um, we understand now that Liz Truss is not really very keen on a so-called emergency budget. She wants what's being called a fiscal event, whatever that is. <laughs> 
I have no idea what that means. Yeah, I wonder um, if she does, maybe. I don't know. We keep hearing the same... Rishi's done the same thing, rebranding the same same old things with yeah. new, usually very, very long <laughs> new names. Uh, I think what is, is clear from that interview there is that we're in a real pickle. And I'm not an economist, so I don't have a very good... Uh, other than instinctive understanding of how we might get ourselves out of it. But what is what very worrying to me, and I imagine will be worrying to many people around the country, is that there isn't very much, a, and sometimes it's a good thing for there to not be agreement over these things so we can fight out for the best solutions. Oh, creative uh, thinking. But there yeah, is... As, there, as Tony Blair would have it. There isn't, there isn't too much consensus, no. I think, about um, how we get ourselves out of this mess. And it is a mess. And what we don't hear very much about is um, what role all of the COVID restrictions has had on this because we knew that we were going to pay for that in terms of economic damage. And I would be interested to know what the impact of that has been on the situation that we're now in. But we we really don't seem to be getting very much by way of clear answers out of this. And I think that suggests that we really just, and, and it, it's not a very, um, it's actually quite a bleak way of seeing it, but that we really are just in a pickle. Yeah, and, and we've got a chance who we've not heard from, Nadim Zahawi. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, stay with us, of course, and uh, also coming up, we'll be debating the big topic of the day as we ask, should the royals try to be normal? Uh, there's a nice normal family for you. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge moving to Windsor with sources close to the couple claiming they want to give their kids a normal upbringing. First, though, let's get an update on the latest news headlines with Tatiana. Thank you, Mark. It is 5.33. I am Tatiana Sanchez in the GB Newsroom. A woman who was reported missing nearly eight weeks ago has been found safe and well. The Met Police say 24-year-old student nurse Owami Davies was found in Hampshire after a call to police from someone who'd seen media appeals. She was last seen walking in Croydon in early July and concern had been growing for her safety. I'd like to say that uh, she's been found safe and well outside of the London area uh, in the county of Hampshire. And she's currently with uh, specialist officers from my team and uh, I can definitely say she's safe and well. My officers have worked around the clock um, following thousands of lines of inquiry in order to locate Tawama Davis. But I would like to thank the media and the members of the public who assisted so much in this, in this case. Police have named a nine-year-old girl who was fatally shot in Liverpool last night as Olivia Pratt Corbell. Officers were called to a house in the Notty Ash area last night after an unknown man, who was being chased by a gunman, forced his way into the property. Police say shots were fired, hitting a woman, Olivia's mother, and then fatally wounded the schoolgirl. A manhunt is underway and police are asking for anyone with information to come forward. Their family are absolutely devastated inconsolable and heartbroken. I know that the murder of Olivia has rocked our communities, who are quite rightly upset and outraged that such an abhorrent crime has occurred here on the streets of Merseyside. Ukraine is on high alert amid fears that Russia could escalate attacks ahead of the country's Independence Day tomorrow. Parts of the capital, Kyiv, aligned with the wreckage of Putin's army. Public gatherings and events are banned there and government employees have been told to work from home. TV online and DAB Plus radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Brazier. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Here's a quick snapshot of today's market. The pound will buy you $1.184 and €1.187. And the price of gold currently stands at £1,477.21 per ounce. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News, investments that matter. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. 
We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Now, oh, welcome back. Uh, just to remind you, you're watching and listening to Brazier with me, Mark Longhurst, uh, sitting in for Colin today uh, on GB News this Tuesday. Uh, it's time for today's visit to Speaker's Corner, part of the show where we let our studio guests to get their views uh, off their chest about a topic they're actually quite passionate about. Well, today, the turn of our political commentator joining us, Emma Webb. So for the next two minutes or so, Emma, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. The persecution of blasphemers is not something of the past, nor is it as far away as we allow ourselves to think. Here in the West, every few years or so, this misperception is punctuated by something. A fatwa against an author, the murder of a filmmaker, a firebombing of a publisher, cartoonists gunned down in their offices, a priest beheaded, a school teacher murdered, and but elsewhere around the world, this is happening all the time to ordinary people, and we barely talk about it. Earlier this year, I made a documentary for ADF International, released yesterday on the UN Day for Remembering the, Those Persecuted for Their Religion. I interviewed a Christian couple, Shagufta and Shafkat, who spent seven years on death row in Pakistan after they were accused of blasphemy. Their faith in the face of death is so unusual to us here in the West that it almost seems miraculous. It serves as a warning to a complacent West of the real, often murderous consequences of accusations of blasphemy. Christians make up a tiny proportion of Pakistan's population, less than 2%. Every day this threat hangs over them. They are abused, discriminated against, and frequently victims of mob violence. Judges too, are too frightened not to give a guilty verdict. And even if they're acquitted, death threats still hang over their heads. And this is not only Pakistan. Christians are persecuted across the world, but we ignore their suffering because Christians are perceived here as privileged, regardless of the facts. Our society has failed to show the same courage as Shagufta and Shafkat, and in doing so, it has set our culture down a dangerous path, a path that makes it easy for accusations of blasphemy to be weaponized to silence political and religious opponents, free thinkers and creatives. I wasn't alive when the fatwa was issued against Salman Rushdie but I have grown up in a culture that increasingly capitulates to threats against three, th three four thought and speech. Instead of responding to the realities of a worldwide problem by standing up unequivocally for our freedom, we have internalized censorship. We have accepted this imposition and let it control what we can say, write and read. In this globalized world, 
what happens elsewhere may as well happen on our doorstep. Shagufta and Shafkat's story serves not only as a light to the world, but also as a warning. Emma, thank you very much indeed for that. And underlined, I guess, by indeed what has happened to Salman Rushdie, uh, indicating the price that you have to pay sometimes for freedom of thought and freedom of speech. Absolutely. And I think it's really important to remember that this is... is obviously, this, the case of Salman Rushdie is, is a big one. Um, and people who were associated with the publication of that book, including his um, translator, also... Um, either lost their lives or faced death threats as a result. So I think that this is a problem that we're seeing around the world. And the fact that, as I mentioned, we've capitulated to this in so many instances, whether it was the Danish cartoon affair, whether it was Charlie Hebdo, mm. um, Paris, we've, yeah. we've created an environment where people who want to make these kind of threats are empowered. And we find ourselves self-censoring in line with these demands that are being imposed on us from an intolerant, uh, intolerant way of thinking. You've had your moment of free speech, though, and, uh, of course, don't forget you can react to what's being said as well. Uh, don't forget you can always email us and tweet us with your views, uh, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Emma, thanks for that. But time now for a debate this hour with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge moving to a cottage on the Windsor estate in uh, what's reportedly an attempt to provide their kids uh, a normal as possible an upbringing. They're moving out of Kensington Palace, and much commentary indeed about this uh, humble downsizing, but many have pointed out that the property is still rather sizeable and that they retain their other homes. So we're asking, should the royals try to appear normal or is any attempt to do so bound to backfire? Well, we're joined by a political commentator once more, Emma Webb, and former Sun Royal correspondent, Charles Ray. Charles, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Um, in a way, right. they're damned if they do, they're damned if they don't, isn't it? You know, we'd like them to be special, and yet we don't want them to be taking too much state money and so on. But this really is a family trying to get their kids into a normal school? Well, it's a normal school. It's a fee-paying school, so yeah. it's not a normal school in the sense of... Uh, Comprehensive, uh, yeah. Everybody else has, has got to go. I mean, they're only following uh, the, the tradition that, you know, Diana set as well for uh, William and Harry. She tried very hard and succeeded, in my view, uh, to give them as normal a life as possible and introduce them to things like McDonald's, visit cinemas, visits to cinemas and theme parks very much the same as yeah, normal normal parents will, will, will do. So it's not that unusual. I mean, we, we're, we're going into a, a new style of uh, royal family, a much more friendlier and cuddlier royal family, if, if you like, with um, certainly William and Catherine, who are, are really doing away with the sort of protocol part of it. And, uh, you know, it's more than just the handshakes. So there's, there's the, the cuddles, there's the chats, there's the laughter. I mean, I think it's all good for the future. One of the big differences is, of course, that the children are not going to be going to boarding school. Uh, this, is, this is a day school. And we do reflect on what Prince Charles has said about his experiences at boarding school uh, and the fact that uh, I think probably, um, you know, Wills and uh, uh, others have, have indicated it's, it's perhaps not the easiest thing when you're a royal to turn up at boarding school. No, it's not. I mean, clearly, if you are a member of the royal family and you turn up and uh, there's various little Johnnies and Freddies around, they're going to see you as a target, uh, you know, and in later years they're going to come up with sort of stories about how they uh, gave the, the young royal a, a hard time. But I, I, I think that the fact that they've gone to this school, which is very much like William and Harry going to Ludgrove uh, when they were younger, yeah. Um, they, they're having a grounding. What about the, the comment that's been about the, the sort of property portfolio? I think even Richard Kay, who is, of course, very close to the Princess of Wales, saying, well, it's a bit much, you know, yet another property when you've got Kensington Palace, you've got Anne Hall in Norfolk, and I think they've got a cottage on Balmoral as well, when everyone else is struggling to make ends meet. They haven't got a cottage on Balmoral. That's actually a commercial property that is actually right. being rented. But they, they have still got Kensington Palace, which is a crown property. They own Amner Hall and they are paying rent uh, on this property um, because that too is a crown property. Uh, I mean, all 
members of the royal family have different types of homes, most of which are crown properties. They, they, they own certain certain properties, like the Queen owns Sandringham, she owns Balmoral, which she inherited from her late father. Uh, so it, it, it's not a question of, you know, too many homes. Yeah. And I laugh, I laugh, to be perfectly honest, Mark, when they call about the, the downsizing to this Adelaide cottage. It's a four-bedroom <laughs> practical mansion. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, it's everything you could possibly want. And we do, of course, reflect on, on the Queen's uh, comment uh, of Buckingham Palace of living above the shop, that uh, they don't sure. get the run of the whole place, that, you know, you've, you've got your apartments and so on. But let's bring em Emma in on this. Is it important that they are seen as being like the rest of us, or do we actually need the royal family to have some majesty? I think that's a really important question because I think there are different aspects to this. On the one hand, I think that uh, William and Kate are right to do what they believe is right for their children. And so, in real terms, making it, making it you know, certain that the future of the royal family do understand the subjects that they, that they will serve in the future, I think that is very important. But in terms of PR, I think it's a real uh, almost deal with the devil to yeah. be trying to push this PR campaign of we are just like everyone else, because that is never a PR campaign they're going to be able to win. The royal family is a custodians of an institution. They are custodians of the crown. And it's constitutionally important that there is some majesty associated with that crown. And so the concern is that in trying to portray themselves as being like the people, they will be setting themselves up to lose and potentially to actually wreak some havoc on the institution of monarchy. So I think what they should actually be doing is trying to raise as down-to-earth future royals as possible, but not making a PR campaign out of it. Right. Charles, while you're with us, just another thought. I don't know if you've seen the, the first two editions of this documentary on, on Diana's death, going through all the conspiracy oh. theories... Uh, yet again, of course, you were very active at, at the time following the story. Uh, this, again, must be very difficult for both William and Harry to run through this and, and react as, quote, normal people, ordinary people. Yeah, I, I mean, I've actually seen all four um, right. episodes now because you can get it on Channel 4 Catch-Up and everything else. Yeah. Um, I started to watch it and the first, certainly the first couple of episodes were giving the impression that they there was some sort of plan uh, to come up with a positive um, evidence that there was a murder. Um, and I, I, was, I was very uncomfortable watching it and certainly watching uh, some of the uh, comment by certain, certain people uh, on there. And I, I watched the whole way through and poor old uh, Lord John Stevens had to deal with 104 conspiracy theories. Yeah. And at the end of it all, at the end of the programme, uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to spoil anybody's enjoyment here, it comes down to the fact that, unfortunately, Princess Diana died in a terrible car crash driven by a man who was drunk. It's, yeah. it's that simple. And I, and I, I keep on watching these programmes and I keep really worrying about William and Harry having yes. to watch this what guff in some yeah. respects. You're giving credence to certain things, like flashing lights in the tunnel, mm. like the Fiat Uno. I, I think there was a Fiat Uno, and I think it did get hit, but it wasn't responsible for killing the Princess of Wales or resulting in the Princess of Wales being killed. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, that, that awful reflection that perhaps if both of them had been wearing seatbelts, they may well have survived the crash, who knows. But, Charles, oh. uh, as, as ever, thank you for your um, expertise and, and your view. It's great to talk to you again. Thanks very much for joining us here on, on GB News. And, of course, uh, Emma with us uh, for the whole programme. Uh, but let's um, boldly go. NASA says it's ready to launch a giant new rocket to the moon on Monday. The space agency officials saying there are no major technical issues to delay the launch after a flight readiness review last night. The readiness uh, of Artemis, the rocket carrying a, an Orion capsule, we're told, known collectively as the Space Launch System, will send the unmanned capsule on an excursion around the moon. And if that mission succeeds... No, this was earlier, 1969. Don't uh, get too excited. Uh, astronauts will be on board once more for subsequent missions. Well, we're joined now by space 
expert Andy Land. And Andy, seeing those pictures yet again of uh, Armstrong on the moon reflects uh, just how long ago it was. And for my generation, certainly, we got very excited and then it, it all just disappeared after Nixon took the funding. Yes, it did. And, and the momentum was lost. I mean, to be fair, Nixon was probably right in what he was trying to, uh, was doing because, of course, there was no long-term plan for the exploration or, or work on the moon. And the technology at the time was really very much at the very limits of what we could achieve. Um, and now it's very different, of course. The technology we have now is far superior. It, it has better possibilities of doing get, getting better returns. Although we had some very good returns from the Apollo program uh, back to technology down here on Earth. But I think it's, that there's more of an opportunity now than ever before for getting good returns from the mission. Let's turn the clock back because one of the criticisms at the time was that the amount of money that was spent getting them onto the moon could have been spent far better uh, ameliorating uh, worldwide poverty. I mean, is that argument going to be made yet again this time? But the market is always going to be made. No matter what you spend money on, there's people going to uh, going to issue with issues with that. Um, but the space program actually takes money from the defence budget as a general yeah, as a yeah. general rule. So the defence people don't usually like it very much because, <laughs> because the money comes out of them. And to be honest, the amount of money being thrown at uh, warfare in the world annually uh, could pay for space research for probably a thousand years. So I think we need to look in other areas for that. Uh, you've also got to look at where what the development of this is the technology does come back into society especially with modern space science technology for instance we're looking at green tech that we need unique green tech to keep astronauts alive in space and to get them to the moon and things like that in fact the apollo program um uh, francis tom bacon developed the um hydrogen fuel cell in britain which was a clean form of generating electricity and the byproduct of course was water had that been pushed forward we wouldn't be in a problem we wouldn't be in the problem yeah. that we actually have now so there is a big bonus to society from these programs. Yeah, of course, the hydrogen cell car just uh, produces water and, and nothing else. But let, let's talk about this, um, this project, Artemis, twin sister of Apollo in Greek mythology, goddess of the moon. Yeah. I mean, is it actually effectively a souped up version of the old Saturn V that took Apollo up? No, this is very different. This is a derivative technology from the space shuttle. And if you have a look at it, you can see the two boosters on the side and the central main tank. Um, so it looks very much like a, a, sh a space shuttle to a right. certain degree, uh, except it's got the new Orion reusable spacecraft capsule on the top of that. Um, this block one is slightly shorter than the Saturn V. Block two, the next one, uh, which will be launched, is actually taller than Saturn V. So this is in uh, sort of little stages to test these things out. And this is the test mission to send the capsule around the moon to see if the mission is viable. Also on board, there's an awful lot of experiments on board. For instance, there are mannequins on board which will test radiation effects on the astronauts to make sure that um, they've got the protection there. Loads of instruments to test the equipment. And it's going to drop some experiments out around the moon as well. So this is a fantastic test mission. The kind of thing they didn't do with Apollo because they didn't have the time for it on Apollo because right. they were kind short. And, yeah. and this is a project that's run for 30 years. Exciting stuff. Boldly going. All stations, all systems go. We shall follow it with interest. Thank you very much indeed uh, for bringing Thank us you. Uh, your view on that. Well, coming up next, uh, out of this world again, Dubes & Co with Michelle, who is here in the studio. What have we got coming up for us this afternoon? Hello. Yes, I mean, another day in lawless Britain. Uh, you've just been covering it as well. The nine-year-old killed in her own home. I mean, what is going on? Is it us, the public? Are we just uh, losing our minds? Is it law and order going wrong? What is it? That's the question that I'm posing tonight. And also, I want to look at leadership more generally. What uh, do we want from our leaders? Do we want them to be one of, one of us? Or, frankly, somewhat better? And lastly, GCSEs and A-levels. Is it time to scrap them? Lovely, Michelle. Thanks very much indeed. Well, that's all the time we've got uh, for today. But thanks for being with me, Mark Longhurst, in for Colin. Colin is back with you at four tomorrow. Let's leave you with the latest weather details. See you again. I'm Alex Deakin with your latest weather update from the Met Office. A dry evening for most out there. Quite warm and humid overnight. We are going to see some wet weather, though, arriving in the west. Here's the bigger picture. Low pressure dominating up to the northwest. Weather fronts have been crossing the UK, but not providing much in the way of rainfall. This little bump, however, in this weather front is going to provide some of the soggy stuff this evening, pushing into southwest Wales initially, but then through the night becoming more widespread across Wales, eventually into 
northern England and southern Scotland. Ahead of that, one or two heavy showers here and there this evening, but they're tending to fade away. Much of eastern England, most of southern England will stay dry. And it's really going to be quite a warm, humid, muggy night with temperatures in urban areas across England and Wales staying in the high teens in places. A little cooler further north, but even here, a pretty warm start to Wednesday. And for many, a wet start across parts of Scotland, northern England, and it's actually going to be a pretty wet day for parts of southwest Wales. That rain likely to linger, some bright colours there, some quite heavy rain. And it pushes back across North Wales into northern England come the afternoon. Either side of that rain band, again drier, cooler day for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but pleasant in the sunshine, but a hot one across East Anglia in the southeast. 30 Celsius is possible here. As we go through Wednesday evening, we're likely to see further pulses of rain across West Wales, South West England, could be quite heavy. And then overnight, there's the possibility of some thundery showers coming up across East Anglia in the southeast, where, of course, we could do really do with some heavy rain. And that may well still be around on Thursday. Some uncertainty about the details of that. So keep up to date with the forecast. We could see those thunderstorms gradually ebbing away during Thursday. A few showers in the northwest. Otherwise, many places dry and bright on Thursday, and for many, a fresher feel as well. Still pretty warm in the southeast.